All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, it's our great pleasure today to welcome Ido Kaminer, um, who will be giving the QFARM seminar. Uh, so Ido, after doing a postdoc at MIT, is uh, now assistant professor at Technion, where he holds the uh, Jacques Lewinet, I'm not sure if that's how you say it, but the uh, cancer, or sorry, the Jacques Lewinet Career Achievement Chair. And today uh, he will be talking to us about free electron quantum optics. Um, so, Take it away, Ido. Thanks. Uh, can you hear, see my screen okay? Let's see that it's, yeah. uh, the sharing is still fine, right? Just to be sure. Well, uh, maybe one thing I should mention for everybody in the audience okay. is that uh, if, you have any, if you have any questions, please write them in the chat and uh, Ido can decide whether he wants to answer those questions during his presentations or at the end of the presentation. Awesome. So uh, thanks for the invitation. And I'm, I'm glad to be giving one of the first uh, QForm seminars for this year. I'm also uh, glad to see some familiar faces from Stanford um, and looking forward for uh, continuing our uh, discussions and collaborations with HEAP as well. Uh, I hope uh, this work, this talk will also be helpful in uh, pushing those uh, ideas forward. Um, I also hope that despite this being uh, in Zoom, you'll feel free to ask some questions. Uh, I'll try to, to see them in the chat. Um, if I miss them, then uh, raise a hand or even uh, remove the mute for a bit, uh, unmute yourself and, and ask, because uh, it doesn't have to uh, be too formal. And I'm glad to, to hear more about uh, thoughts and questions along the way, especially with people that I, I know for some years now. Um, so uh, let me start by saying that I'm uh, now an assistant professor at the Technion uh, since 2018. I was before this uh, a postdoc at MIT. Um, where I started uh, going from theory to experiments and uh, started doing experiments with electron beams uh, and now exploring uh, a lot of uh, what I think is beautiful physics on the borderline between electron, free electrons and, it's, uh, and the interactions free electrons can do with, with light and matter. Uh, and I'll talk about a couple of examples we've done in the lab recently and some theoretical ideas that we are now pursuing as well. Um, and this is uh, going to be the center uh, of the talk. A lot of what we're now uh, pursuing, uh, we are also testing experimentally in a system that combines electron microscopy and femtosecond pulse lasers. Um, and I'll say more about this system. Um, but first, a few words about what we're doing in a group. So we're, we're looking into uh, different types of physics on the borderline of quantum physics and its applications. We are seeing uh, new ways we can generate X-rays uh, from free electrons. Um, and if I have time, I'll say uh, maybe a little bit uh, towards the end on this. We're also uh, working on ultra-fast detectors and specifically how we can use ideas from nanophotonics to enhance scintillators. Um, we're working on ideas from quantum optics, especially in the regime where the uh, laser fields are extremely nonlinear, which seems like harmonic generation, looking for quantum optics phenomena there and working on what uh, I'll talk about this later more, but this is what we call macroscopic quantum electrodynamics or macroscopic QED, um, which is uh, something that we find uh, as a very powerful set of tools. Um, and what I'll be focusing on today is the quantum interactions that we can reach with free electrons. And I think has beautiful physics that we can explore and there are new experimental systems in a couple of groups around the world, uh, also in Stanford, that can really look into those effects. But before I go all the way there, I want to start with a, with a simple uh, picture. Um, and I, I actually wonder whether anyone here can recognize uh, the, the, per, the people in this uh, photo. Um, if you have uh, a guess, who are those, who are those people? Um, so for like uh, five seconds to, to try and guess, uh, typically one of them is uh, pretty easy to recognize. Um, and that's the left person, which I don't know his name, but he's probably the king of Sweden, uh, awarding the Nobel Prize. Um, the figure on the right is, uh, is a person getting the Nobel, Nobel Prize in physics for 1958. And this is a, a person that uh, uh, did his discovery that led to this uh, uh, Nobel Prize in, in his PhD in 1934. This is Cherenkov. And after him, we now call the Cherenkov effect. So I want to say a few words about the Cherenkov effect because I know that uh, many don't run into it in undergrad. Um, and I think the best way to explain this uh, phenomena is to look at its uh, analog in uh, sound waves. Because when, when we have a, a jet plane crossing the speed of sound, we are used to hearing this sonic boom. 
that is in its essence an interference of sound waves. What happens is that the emitter moves faster than the sound waves in a way that allows the waves that are emitting, emitted from it to constructively interfere. And they constructively interfere along a cone that moves away from that plane. And this constructive interference causes the very sharp, very strong boom, sonic boom that is created by jet, jet plane. Uh, the same phenomena happens when another sound, another source of waves, this is electromagnetic waves this time, and that can be any charged particle that emits electromagnetic waves, will be moving faster than the velocity of those waves. So when can we have a charged particle moving faster than the velocity of electromagnetic waves, faster than the velocity of light? That happens when the electromagnetic waves are slowed down by some medium. And for example, whenever we see nuclear reactors glow in the movies, submerged in water, it's because particles are emitted from them, and those are energetic enough to cross the speed of light in the water around the nuclear reactor. And that causes the same kind of effect, interference of electromagnetic waves, constructive interference that causes a shock front. And that sharp shock front is a shock wave of light that is emitted in what we've typically seen as blue light coming as Cherenkov radiation. Now, the uh, effect of Cherenkov radiation is actually relatively easy to explain theoretically. And in a, a couple of lines, uh, starting from Maxwell's equations, we can show that the following is going to occur. If a particle is moving through a medium, the radiation is going to be emitted in a cone, like you can see here. And the angle of the cone is going to be connected to the velocity of the particle at the index of refraction of the medium in the formula that we see here. This is the Cherenkov angle formula. Cos theta is the velocity of, of light in free space over the velocity of the particle times the index of refraction. Or you can think about it as the ratios between velocities of the light in the medium and the particle. Um, and uh, what I think is quite interesting about this effect is you can also see it, and we'll see it this later, as a, an effect of phase matching, exactly like what we teach in nonlinear optics. When we think about phenomena in nonlinear optics, the same kind of effect can be described here, but between one wave, which is an electron, and one wave, that, which is the light. Um, so Cherenkov radiation is something that we are using in a bunch of places. Um, and we actually use that to identify high energy particles coming from out of space. Um, uh, outer space. Uh, this is, for example, particles that are moving through the atmosphere. They are energetic enough to move faster than the speed of light in the atmosphere. And that um, emits those Cherenkov showers that are detected in a set of detectors that are placed in the, de in the desert. And there are smaller um, Cherenkov detectors called ring imaging Cherenkov detectors in several high energy physics experiments in CERN. Um, also, there was one until recently in the International Space Station. And those are all using the same kind of effect Cherenkov radiation to find the velocity of the particle, um, then identify the mass of the particle from that, and we can identify what particle it is. And what's interesting in all of those phenomena, in all of those examples of the use of the trunk of phenomena, is that we always model the radiation as a classical effect. We always think about Cherenkov radiation as a classical uh, radiation that is emitted as a solution of Maxwell's equations, even when it's emitted from very complicated particles. Um, and that's something that I would like to explore today. To what extent can we see corrections to this old pheno ph phenomenon um, with modern experiments? And there are, until recently, no experiments showing anything quantum in the Cherenkov effect. Now I want to show you how we can really start breaking that. Um, and for this, uh, I, I'll actually uh, tell you how I ran into it. Um, with, at the beginning of my postdoc at MIT, I was curious about this effect. And specifically, I, I thought what happens to a particle, let's say a charged particle, when its wave function becomes a little bit complicated. For example, electron beams can carry uh, the wave functions that will be moving in a vortex. This is a topic that was, uh, since 2010, been attracting some attention in the community, how you can modify the wave functions of single electrons. Uh, to, for example, carry vorticity, orbital angular momentum in them. And my, my question was, how is this quantum effect going to change radiation that is emitted from those particles? And there are several important, still open questions related to this general question of what, what a wave function of a particle is going to do to radiation emitted from it. But in the special case of triangle radiation, that's the first thing I did uh, back then at MIT. And Originally, without knowing that this question actually uh, interested scientists many years before uh, I, I thought about looking into it, uh, Vitaly Ginzburg, uh, the, the famous Vitaly, Vitaly Ginzburg from uh, the Soviet Union, in his PhD in 1940, actually did his PhD on the quantum description of the Cherenkov effect. Um, and he wrote this beautiful paper in 1940 uh, that was translated to English only many years later after the Second World War. And it, 
uh, right after him, Sokolov, also a very famous Soviet uh, physicist, worked on the same kind of effect and even added relativistic corrections coming from that. Um, and that was originally also a reason why it was not very simple to publish uh, the concept that we can actually find new corrections coming from quantum effects when, when in their original papers they claim that those corrections are going to be negligible. So let me tell you one interesting anecdote about the quantum corrections to the Cherenkov effect. This is from a paper that Ginsburg wrote in 1996, so 56 years after he finished his PhD. Okay, and that's uh, quoting from, from him. He explains why the corrections coming from a quantum description of the Cherenkov effect are very small. And then even saying that in 1940, Landau told about my work, stated that it was of no interest. And adding, it follows from the above that he was fully justified in drawing this conclusion. And his comment, he DeMarcus was usual with his criticism. criticism. So I, I can just imagine a PhD student gives forgetting this feedback from Landau on his PhD topic. Um, and I think it is quite, quite amazing that we can look back into effects that were seen as negligible for many, many years and see how by looking at somewhat different features and especially by using experimental techniques that didn't exist back, back then, can really find corrections that are not, not negligible and find new physics when looking into those things. Um, and I think what is uh, going to be interesting to understand for in a more general sense is that all of those effects, what, we, what I call Cherenkov radiation, but also a family of effects that is much richer than Cherenkov radiation, are all consequences of the same idea of a phase-matched interaction between electron and light waves. Um, and for this, uh, I want to explain um, what we today understand as the different types of quantum effects that can exist when we're looking into phase-matched interactions of electrons and photons, or generally charged particles and light. Um, what do we mean by quantum when we say quantum interaction is suddenly quantum? So there could be three types of quantum effects um, with very different meanings. In one of them is that the quantization of the electromagnetic field becomes significant. Um, for example, the fact that the radiation emitted from the particle cannot be th thought of as a continuous radiation, but as something made up from individual photons, so they carry discrete momentum, um, and that causes recoil in a discrete way. That kind of correction is quantum in the sense of the electromagnetic field being quantum. And Ginsburg, for example, worked on this. Um, that is, was the, the one quantum effect he really described in his 1940 paper. Um, but there is a one very different quantum effect that one can think of, and that's the quantum wave nature of the electron. So the electron can be quantum. The wave nature of the electron can matter to how the radiation is emitted. For example, the transverse features of the electron can change the radiation, like the orbital angular momentum is something that a transverse feature of the electron wave function carries. That's what I looked at in my paper from 2016, but also longitudinal features of the wave function of the electron can be significant um, in looking into the, uh, how radiation is changed. So think about the electron as being shaped in the longitudinal, longitudinal direction like a pulse. And on this, there are a series of, of papers, really interesting work by Nahita Levy, later on by Avi Gover and uh, Iming Pan. Um, and those will be actually related to an effect that I'll be talking about later, which is uh, the effect that we call PNM in uh, connecting electron microscopy and electron radiation. This even exists without phase matching. And now there is a third type of quantum effect, uh, if I wrap it all together. And this is when high order processes in quantum electrodynamics become important. So we cannot think about radiation as really individual photon emission, but there could be a real absorption of that photon. So higher order diagrams can become significant. And this is, uh, seems harder to get. There is currently one work that we have done uh, exploring this uh, and seeing conditions where this can actually happen in existing experiments. Um, but to, what is true to say about all of those three kinds of quantum effects that so far none of them was observed. Um, and I want to show you the first experiment that sees one type of quantum correction, specifically this, the, center, the second one, where the electron wave function matters. And I wish I could have uh, give you new, give, uh, uh, your examples of the other kinds of quantum effects. That's uh, not, we're not yet there. Um, but what about the wave nature of the electron and how it's going to change phase matched interactions? Uh, so what uh, uh, we have done in order to reach to this point is, uh, and this is going to be an implementation of a Cherenkov effect uh, in a system that allows the wave nature of the electron to play a role, okay? 
And this is going to be an inverse Cherenkov effect. And let me explain how we are going to get there. Um, the students that led this in my group is Sarah Nehemia, who's a master's student that designed this even before we built a setup. And Rafael Dahan, uh, who's going to be soon a PhD student and was the one that achieved the experimental breakthrough that allowed this to happen. Um, so what we did here is taking a prism of a glass. This is a prism where by coupling the light in the right angle, you can get the light to, tot to do total internal reflection from the edge of the prism. And that by aligning the angle, the angle carefully, we can reach the angle theta here relative to the edge of the prism, also relative to where the electron is going to pass. We're going to send those electrons grazing the surface of the prism. So they angle between the light and the electron is going to be exactly the theta that satisfies the Cherenkov condition. What is happening there is that the light is being absorbed very efficiently into the electron in exactly the opposite process from what we think about as Cherenkov radiation when the light is normally emitted at the same angle. Okay, and that condition is going to give us extremely strong interactions between the electron and the light. Why we do it this way? Why not send the electron through the glass? Simply because the electron will not survive a long, long uh, process uh, in, inside the, gl the glass, it will do too many co other collisions. So we're looking for a trick to keep the electron in vacuum while still having it interact with the material for long enough. And this is why grazing experiments are so important. And actually, there is a beautiful experiment from a few years ago by the Homolov group that really inspired us to look into this kind of uh, geometry, where they took a scanning electron microscope um, and did a similar kind of interaction using a glass prism with somewhat very different geometry, but still similar concept. Um, but they couldn't reach the coherency or the energy resolution to really see quantum effects there. Um, so that was also not necessarily their intent. Still, the kind of geometry is something that was done there first. Um, and now, what is really the key challenge in order to see the effect we're seeing is the ability to bring an electron to graze the surface, you know, the small enough proximity for a long enough distance. And this is a very similar uh, challenge to what is important for accelerators on chip. Um, and this was also what drew us to much more discuss interesting discussions with the ACHIP uh, collaboration. So this was really the key challenge. And what allowed this to happen for us is a set of uh, advancements in using the electron microscope in a way that avoids, for example, the magnetic fields in, in the surrounding and other effects that allowed us to keep the electron collimated uh, for a long enough distance. And in this case, it's a 500 micron long interaction where we keep about 50% of the electron uh, alive during this interaction. Now, uh, that is the sample, and you can actually see the image of that here. This entire thing is placed inside this scheme here. I'll show later on a bit more about it. But uh, what is critical to understand about it is, is just two things here. One is that we use two pulses, one to excite electrons from a tip. This is telling us how we time the electron arrival, so we can create electron pulses. The other one is interacting with those electrons. So we have uh, the electron interacting at the right timing with the laser, with the pulse of light that accelerates it or that exchanges energy with it. And then we take those electrons and measure their energy distribution. And this is an electron energy spectrometer, which is a beautiful piece of technology in uh, transition electron microscopes today. We call it the ELS, electron energy loss spectrometer, and it allows us to see energy change of those electrons and measure the electron energy spectrum. And most of the figures I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides are coming from here. Altogether, this kind of system that is driving electrons with pulses is what we call the ultra-fast transmission electron microscope or the UTEM. And that's the experimental setup that we are going to do a lot of, uh, of fun physics with. So now what is uh, happening for uh, uh, an electron that is interacting with the surface? Actually, let me have a... Yeah, so actually I have a question about how does this relate to uh, Klaus Ropper's experiment near uh, metal tips. There is a, a nature paper from 2015 that made it quite famous. And I'll get to that um, and explain more about the uh, Klaus Ropper's experiment that is actually connected to it in an interesting way. Um, but the most important thing to say uh, is that we're going to reach phase matching here for the first time in experiments of this type. Without phase matching, one can do simpler interactions. And I'll explain uh, more about them later. So there is a, a piece of literature that is using similar kinds of experiments and, we, and are uh, part of what really drew us into this field, the realization that we can use those kind of experimental setups to do those the phase mesh experiments. Um, so I will uh, 
let me uh, then explain about what's happening there. How do we think about the interaction of an electron with the surface in this case? And the important thing to understand is that we can compare two descriptions. One of them is thinking about electrons as point particles, and the other one is thinking about electrons as, as, as quantum waves, as quantum wave packets, and compare the experimental results for both uh, scenarios. So if the electron is an extended wave, it's going to look something like this, some kind of extended wave that is moving along the surface. It sees the evanescent wave that is from the light that was, total internal, that was doing total internal reflection on the edge. Um, and now, what is happening when this electron is phase matched with the light? You can think about this electron wave, it's moving at the same velocity with the phase velocity of the light. So at every point along the surface, different parts of that wave function, electron wave function, sees fields that are pointing up, and some parts of that same electron wave function sees a field that is pointing down. So the electromagnetic field that fluctuates can actually uh, see one part of the electron wave function. Classically, it would be a point particle that either, either sees the field always pointing down or sees the field always pointing up. Now, as long as the acceleration is not too strong and it doesn't slip away from the, this point, we can actually give the electron more energy when it's synchronized the right way or slow it down in the most efficient way when it's synchronized in the, in the opposite way. What happens to the wave function is that it actually does both at the same time. So parts of that electron wave function, part of the same electron is accelerated strongly and part of them is, is decelerated strongly. If it's not phase matched, if we, and we'll see this in a moment, this will be averaged out very, in a significant way. So how does this look like experimentally? If you uh, measure the electron energy spectrum, and this is a, an example of such a measurement, you see over a range of a couple of hundreds of electron volts, um, we see uh, the electron energy spectrum becoming a discrete set of peaks. And this is what we see here as this very broad comp. And when we zoom in, you see the oscillations here. So we have electrons hitting at specific energy points at the dist a distance that is exactly a single photon energy. So we see scenarios where the same electron is either accelerated by a discrete number of uh, photon quanta or decelerated by a certain number of photon quanta. And I think uh, one way to understand that is to think about a double slit experiment or diffractions of uh, electrons. We, saw that, we know that a double slit experiment can cause fringes that come as a, in space as a result of combining, uh, combining uh, moment, different momentum waves coming from different slits. So you can think about the exact same thing happening here with the light wave forming a bunch of slits in time, and that creates a comp of peaks, these fringes, those fringes in energy. And this analog actually goes very well mathematically, but uh, if someone wants to think about it this way, it's a Fourier, uh, the Fourier between time and energy versus momentum and, and space, it's possible to do it this way. Um, now, it, I think it's important to see the role of phase matching, and we can see this easily if we compare uh, what happens without phase matching. So this electron's velocities slip away. So it is accelerated and decelerated at the same time, at uh, different times, and that averages out. And that's also what we see if we simulate it, or if we change the velocity a little bit. Here we had to use electron kinetic energy of 207.2 keV. So that it was exactly matched. And once we change it by less than one kilo electron volt relative to the 207 here, uh, we got the acceleration and deceleration, the spread of energy to be significantly reduced. And this is also what we see experimentally. You can also see here what happens if you solve this for classical point particles. So the main significant difference is that the peaks, the, those ex sharp features are completely uh, disappearing. So the classical point particle will only give you this envelope, the black curve here. Um, there are additional corrections coming from the quantum effect and I can talk about this more. But, uh, to make a, a connection now to a, a more general theory and also then touch on the Ropper's paper. Um, if we uh, want to understand the interaction of an electron in an electromagnetic field and ask what is going to be to happen to this electron when interacting with some electric and magnetic field and when it has an in initial energy E naught and we are want to know what is going to be the final energy of that electron at some point uh, after the field is gone. So that kind of problem is something that if you only know high school physics and never heard about quantum mechanics, there is a very, uh, very uh, simple formula we learn, learn about the Lorentz force. It's a way to solve exactly this problem. We know the force acting on that electron at every point in time as the QE plus QV cross B. 
and we can integrate that and find the energy change. And it will look something like this if there was a specific initial energy to that electron. There is always some small distribution. It will be accelerated by some amount. And that's what we expect classically to see happening for a single electron going through an electromagnetic field. But what we actually see in the lab, this, seeing this uh, figure from the Ropers Group 2015 paper is really what drew me into this field. Uh, that this is, I think, a beautiful example. That's all experimental in this slide that I took from their paper. You see the discrete peaks here. It shows you right away that there is something quantum happening here. There are multiple locations for the same electron to hit. And those peaks in, in energy are also separated exactly by h bar omega. So h bar pops into this game. Um, and to be able to explain this, what we really need to do is to take the Schrodinger equation. Um, and add the electromagnetic potentials, uh, phi and a, the scalar and vector, by, which we could do through gauge changes like this, and then solve this partial differential equation, which gives us exactly a beautiful match with the theory, for, uh, with the data from the 2015 paper. Actually, the first place this was measured was not in 2015, even though this made it somewhat famous, but in another, another nature paper by the Zoel group in 2009. Um, and I think those papers are really uh, opening uh, a lot of eyes and making us curious to see if we see those kinds of hints of quantum effects in free electron physics, what is really the, the overall importance of quantum effects in other experiments that are based on free electrons? If we think about synchrotrons or free electron lasers, where would a quantum effect be significant? Uh, and there are questions along those lines that were uh, thought about, for example, in the context of free electron lasers and the quantum regime there. Um, but I think that the experimental schemes we, we now have are allowing us to revisit a lot of those problems and really see them experimentally for the first time. Um, there, is interest, there are interesting discussions on this in papers by Peter Baum, actually, and I give two references here, if someone is curious, uh, on the, this classical quantum analog. Um, so I want to take one slide to explain the, the theory behind the scenes how we think about those electrons, how we can really start from the Schrodinger equation and get all the way down. And you will see that very quickly, we reach to a model where we can think about electrons as a ladder of energy levels. So this is a ladder where the electron can go up and down by discrete amount of absorbing and emitting uh, photon quanta. And the theory behind the scenes here is now called in the community, the PNM theory or the photon induced near field electron microscopy theory, because this was first discovered as an effect that was thought about as a tool in microscopy. And we now see that it can do a lot of other things as well. So if we take the Schrodinger equation um, and put in the vector potential and scalar potential, what we can do to make this uh, solvable analytically is use a paraxial approximation where we uh, assume the momentum of the electron is very significant in one direction, neglect the transverse motion. Um, this is a very strong approximation to apply here, but it's also very useful. Um, and it gives us a first order differential equation in a time and space um, with the electromagnetic uh, E field, only the Z polarization remaining as significant. Um, this was done uh, analytically in parallel back then by Garcia de Bajo and Matthew Kosiak and also by Sankte Park from the Zoel group. There were two papers from 2010. Um, and what you get, when you do, what you do when you see an equation of this type, it's linear, it's first order in, in time and, and Z, only one space parameter, and it has a time-depending field, is that the best way to approach this is a, it is like a Fluquet problem, or a Fourier series is the best expansion that will solve that. So we replace the wave function with a sum over coefficients, we call them FL, and those can be thought of as the amplitudes of the electron having a specific energy change by an L, L being an integer number, positive or negative. And this Fourier expansion allows us to solve analytically exactly this problem with one parameter we need to define. This will be a G is a dimensionless interaction strength. Um, and it uh, actually looks a lot like any Fourier integral over the electric field. You can show that in a dielectric laser accelerator, the same kind of parameter uh, can give us the acceleration amount just multiplying by H bar omega here. Um, and this G is what goes into a Bessel function that gives us analytically the Fourier, com the components of the energy amplitudes of the energy in different locations. And this is the probability then is J Bessel function squared with a G single uh, dimensional parameter inside. It's very elegant and very simple and the match to experiments is, is, is amazing. And of course, we are starting to see more and more places where this start, this is breaking. And that's where I think the most interesting physics is also hiding. Uh, one uh, 
one point to add about this slide is that my, my first student, my first PhD student in the group, Ori Reinhardt, when he started working on this, was really uh, bothered by the fact that the theory was not uh, starting from a relativistic uh, equation of uh, uh, wave equation for the electrons, but from the Schrodinger equation. And he introduced, uh, he, he resolved this starting from Klein Gordon and later Dirac as well. And when you do that, you find a correction. It's not exactly right to actually put here gamma to change m to gamma m. You, need, you can only do this in the longitudinal direction, but you can show that under the paraxial approximation, this small change is uh, enough. And it actually showed uh, that there was a mistake in the 10 years of papers on this field. And you can see a bunch of errata published uh, over the last two years following his uh, insistence, uh, arguing with some scientists in our community for a while. Uh, so yes, this is worth being stubborn sometimes. Um, so how do, how do we see experiments based on this theory? Um, so if we have an electron with an initial energy at some point, uh, what we see once we do a simple experiment putting a laser light to interact with it is this change of energy that is discrete. We measure the energy change. We see peaks on the right and left absorbing one photon or emitting one photon. Okay, that is the typical measurement we see in a lab all the time. So we see the energy of the electron changing by one photon to the uh, higher up or down. Now, if we increase the laser density, we will typically see something like this. There will be a bunch of peaks on the sides. The distance between them is exactly h bar omega again and again. Um, with more multi integer multiples. Now, what is the, the really the qualitative difference is what happens once we use phase matching. And suddenly what we see is that the electron energy spectrum is different in a really interesting way. It spreads out and you can see this discrete number of peaks and um, you can even see how this extends over a wide, wide range of energies. Okay, and this is a you know, this is really what happens to the electron energy. It spreads over a very wide range when the phase matching is, is accurate. And that's mostly because this strength of interaction, the Fourier element G, increases significantly by several orders of magnitude. And it really changes the shape, the way the vessel description uh, is holding. So let me uh, explain more about what is really happening here if I, if I zoom in on an individual interaction. Because uh, what we observed in this experiment uh, is something like uh, 1700 EV width of this discrete peak. And we really took care to measure that it is quantum all the way. We zoom in on each part there uh, to see the discrete individual elements. Uh, of course, uh, since then, we actually got some uh, an HIP sample and we multiplied this range by more than a factor of two. And I think we can do even much more than this. And if you uh, draw from these conclusions about HIP experiments in general, about any dielectric laser accelerators, it is very likely that all of them will have quantum features to some extent, depending on the coherency of the electron, because there is a, a very strong analogy between them. And I'll say a bit more about this later. Um, I also got a, a question on a, um, if, we can, if I can say more about the experimental requirements for this kind of strong coupling in comparison with the requirements for accelerators on chip experiments. And I, this analogy, I'll, I'll say something about it. I have a few slides for the, uh, towards the end to compare classical and quantum theory. But in essence, there is a very strong analogy between the two. And then we're still exploring to see what's the consequences. I'll try to say a few things about what we don't know yet, because there are still some open questions uh, about this analogy. Uh, so uh, I want to uh, say something about uh, what is the, really the meaning of an individual peak here? Because I think there is a point that is really confusing. When we, when we look at an individual peak here, like this one, this is the case where the electron did not change its energy, okay? And there is a, one peak to the right, since this is a loss, is actually where the electron lost one photon of energy, which means it actually got to emit one more photon into the field. And there are also points of the same type on the other side, where it's actually absorbing one photon. So you can see this one is this diagram. So the electron is absorbing a single photon quanta. Right, and like the same kind of diagram, you will also have a lot more right on different sides, like the electron can, for example, absorb three photon quanta. Now, why do I focus on each individual element here? Because uh, I think there is something very confusing about it. And this is something we are usually drawing a security diagram. We blame Feynman for those. Um, but uh, we also learned something very basic about those kinds of diagrams in first year physics. And it is that they are supposed to be forbidden. Um, the fact that those diagrams cannot occur is something we, we see in first year physics by learning about conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. 
if you take the momentum conservation, in this case, the initial momentum is increased by one photon momentum and the initial energy is increased by one photon energy, um, and also force the dispersion relation of the photon and of the electron, you cannot solve those equations together. The solution of those uh, four equations with those requirements will never give you a result. Um, uh, and that will be, uh, the, you can actually see this geometrically. If you plot the dispersion of the electron, this is the hyperbola in energy and momentum, and you also plot the light line under it, you can see that an absorption of one photon looks something like this. You start from a point and you absorb it and you go to another point on this version of the electron. And that is supposed to change by the photon energy and momentum. But the photon energy and momentum has to be parallel to the light line here. And this kind of geometry uh, logic is something that Levi Schechter showed me when I was still an undergrad um, at the Technion. Uh, he's also one of the uh, people behind the theory of uh, DLAs. And I think this was always bothering me because we see that, you know, experimentally we have the peaks happening here. So is there some uh, fundamental contradiction here? The, the answer is no, there is, there is no real fundamental contradiction. But the reason that we allow those diagrams to occur, even the first order diagram, uh, is that there is a medium there. The photon is not really in free space. And that is very familiar for people from DLA, from HIP. Um, once there is a medium involved, then the conservation laws are different. And the one thing that changes is that the photon dispersion is not the same. We cannot think about this photon as a free space photon anymore. But for example, in the simplest case of an homogeneous medium, like in a Cherenkov experiment, uh, there is a new index of refraction added here. And that thing alone tilts the light line and allows that transition to occur. And now let's think about this more, more generally. If we change the dispersion of the photon, we can do that in a much more complicated way than an index. We can think about a periodic structure. We can think about a plasmonic structure. We can think about two-dimensional materials holding uh, polaritons like graphene plasmons and phonon polaritons that are now very famous. And all of those will change the photon in one way or another. We can give the, the photon a lot of very fancy names, but in the end, it's going to be a photon of different type of dispersion. And when we go with this photon back into the quantum diagrams, we see that the entire way we do quantum electrodynamics has to change following the way we change the photon. So that dressed photon quantum electrodynamics is what we call MQED. Um, this field actually expanded over the years with contributions from Glauber and Le Lowenstein. Um, and in more recent years, and the best review, technical review, and this is by Schielen Buchmann, um, that really summarized the, the formalism that allows to do that. And we gave several contributions to it in regards to using free electrons with MQED and also with 2D materials. And we're now having a new review coming out in Nature Reviews Physics in about a month and a half um, that is talking about how we can really explore quantum electrodynamics with the optical environment as a key factor. Okay, so uh, using that logic, I, I want to then go back to the Cherenkov effect and make a small summary because what I think is really beautiful to see is that the same uh, effect can be described in several different ways. One of them is to think about the Cherenkov effect as the absorption or emission, depends if it's the Cherenkov or the inverse Cherenkov, of a photon by an electron uh, in a medium with some index. Or we can do it this way or with a diagram calculating it QED or you, we can take conservation laws. And if you start from those four equations and put the index here and solve them all the way, just solve that like first year physics, um, you get exactly the Cherenkov angle. You get exactly this formula. Um, and you will actually see a quantum correction, an H bar there that you should neglect. And this will exactly be the Ginsburg work from 1940. So this is actually exactly equivalent to what you will get from Maxwell's equations. And those different approaches, QED conservation laws or solving Maxwell's equations will give you the same thing. And all of those, are examples of a, an effect of phase matching because you can show that this all occurs always exactly the condition where the phase velocity of the light matches with the velocity of the electron. And that's what we think about as phase, as phase matching. And this is really a way to think about the interaction with the electron as a way to introduce some kind of medium and make optical nonlinearity occur. Because the fact that the electron changes its energy in discrete amounts does it mean, for example, that a photon can also be emitted in multiples of H per omega? Can we get harmonic generation from those kinds of interactions? Um, that is something that is, sounds very likely, actually, 
because if you think about how high harmonic generation started, it was through what is known as above threshold ionization, a p bunch of peaks of electron peaks that was, were observed by putting a strong laser on an electron. And what we actually have in every experiment that is accelerating an electron is exactly the same thing. So understanding whether we can create new kinds of optical nonlinearities from this quantum description for electron laser interaction, I think it's a very important and interesting question to, to think about. Um, and I want to uh, say a few things about how this behaves without phase matching. But before this, um, I'll, I'll summarize the theory for what we had to do to describe this experiment. Um, because in the end, this is what happened in the lab. But we have a, pre a big prism. You can see a second round of this laser light pulse coming. And this laser light pulse having multiple oscillations uh, of the wave. And you see the, the, phase, the phase velocity and group velocity here moving. And the electron extended wave function is matched with that uh, mo motion of wave. And when we follow the theory, and this is exactly the process I showed you before, we start from, with the Schrodinger equation. We put a vector potential inside. We put some relativistic correction into it. We go through the process. We have to define a dimensionless parameter, the same one we defined before. But here, uh, unlike previous experiments in the field, we had to actually take into account the fact that the wave evolves while the electron is moving. So that dimensionless parameter is suddenly becoming a factor of time, uh, depending on time. If you remove this time dependence, you will get back to the theory from 2010. And if you put it back, this is actually what we have to do for explaining the data we see here. And now, now to match to, this, uh, to the data, to the experimental data, what we do is we take those Bessel amplitudes, the probabilities of being in each energy state. This forms what we call the coherent electron probability density. as a bunch of Bessel coefficients time delta functions, the energy locations. And now we have to convolve this coherent electron distribution with a, a actual incoherent probability density that describes the incoherent part of the electron, the statistics part of the electron of when it arrives, what energy it has, because it's not fully coherent and it never is. There is always some incoherency to it as well. And while doing this uh, convolution, we get a distribution in time and energy and space. And this is, it gives a beautiful match to the experimental results. Um, as a quick slide, this is like a data that we measured summarizing the, ev everything we measured, including the time delay between the arrival of the laser pulse and the electron pulse. And that's the y-axis here. And we see this extends over a very wide range in the theory using the conventional, what we call PNM theory versus the extended PNM theory gives us uh, a match that is much better in terms of the extent it gets to. And also some very small features between the experiment that we see here and the two kind of quantum theories. So it shows you very clearly that we have to extend the quantum theory to something that we introduced new in this paper. And that's the match we see there. Um, okay, so uh, with this, um, I, I finished the, like the core part of, of the talk, but I want to take a couple of minutes to talk about the experiments that we're not running now that also connect to accelerators on chip. Um, <clears throat> for this, a little bit about the setup. So what we are using uh, in the lab is a JOL microscope. It's a JOL, a Japanese company for transmission electron microscopy. Uh, we have a relatively wide range of energies. We wanted to have the flexibility to work for between 40 kV to 200 kV. Um, we have a relatively high power uh, laser from light conversion and an OPA and a DFG. Uh, everything marked with stars here is currently the only one of this type in the community. We had several very significant uh, custom uh, changes to the system to allow us to work in a tunable energy range, for example. Um, the installation of the system started around October 2018. Uh, we started doing experiments from early 2019, and we're now about a year and a half into running experiments and dealing with technical issues. Uh, we had a, a few very interesting things happening with that. Uh, and uh, and I, I want to give a, like a minute to just say that this is part of a community that started in electron microscopy, and the whale was really uh, pushing this field in a very strong way. And in 2009, had the first paper showing those quantum features in the interaction. Then 2010 was theoretical uh, work explaining it. And then what uh, I think made it much more famous uh, was a 2015 by the Ropers group that showed how you can treat this uh, quantum mechanically and think about it as a quantum walk or a rabi oscillations of the electron. 
Um, then in the same year, the carbonic group from EPFL also used this as a technique to image plasmons. As it showed it is a powerful near-field optical microscope. Um, there are other groups with very significant contributions. Um, and we recently had uh, a back-to-back -back paper in Nature with the Ropus group, where in both groups we showed how we can measure the lifetime of uh, light in cavities. And they worked with uh, whispering gallery modes. We worked with photonic crystal cavities. And we showed how we can image uh, the modes in those cavities and get uh, the dispersion, the pen structure, the block mode pictures, and also the lifetime of each mode in different times there. Um, and if I had more time, I can talk about this more, but I'll probably uh, prefer to say something about a connection to, to the electric laser accelerators in the couple of minutes we have. So imagine that uh, this is something that I, uh, we, we brought up um, last summer, actually, just the uh, end of spring last year. Uh, a little bit before the ACHIP uh, meeting in Japan in September. Um, it feels like ages ago because there was corona in between. But what we thought uh, we can do is let's use our setup and the ability that we already learned to match uh, those interactions with uh, and put here some interesting structure that will be much more advanced than the, the prism we used for the first experiment. And this is really part of the, of the concept of uh, particle accelerators on a chip. Um, uh, this HIP uh, uh, collaboration that I think many of you in Stanford are, know very well for, for a couple of years. Um, and the student who really led the experiments here is Yuval Adiv, with the help of Raphael that I mentioned before. He's a master's student in this group, uh, did really beautiful stuff with this. Uh, and the samples that I'll show you in a minute, minute uh, got, uh, we got them from a, like a really a hard effort last summer uh, by Peyton and Dylan, also with a, uh, with Ken Little and others. Uh, Joel is now supporting us in analyze, analyzing this. So uh, you can really hear more about this, especially ask Peyton about the uh, heroic uh, quest to actually get a samples on time. Um, and what you'll see is a, a silicon chip. It's all made on silicon with a MESA structure on top and gradings curved into it. And those are elements actually, have, we have an SEM image that we got from your side to how the structures look like. And we uh, relatively quickly managed to bring the electrons to interact with it in a relatively efficient way. Um, this was really exciting for us because we tried to get the acceleration of the electron with the least amount of energy. And we got femtosecond, several hundreds of femtoseconds of, uh, of uh, sorry, several hundreds of femtojoules of uh, laser pulse to be enough to actually cause acceler acceleration, measurable acceleration for the electron. Uh, we are trying to push it all the way down to a point where a single photon makes acceleration possible and to see what kind of physics changes there. And those structures seems to be the most efficient way, uh, the most efficient thing possible for that. Um, so uh, let me show you uh, a comparison. If we take this theory, it starts from Schrodinger equation. And how does this compare to a classical description of the same thing that we do classically? Uh, if we take this theory and now ask what is really the distribution we get at the end. This is the electron energy distribution as a function of time and energy, and, and also where the electron hits. So x, y, energy, and delta t for the time between the electron pulse and the laser pulse. So that one we can compare with the classical theory. And what is the key element that we need to change is this rho coherence, the coherent electron probability density that is made up from discrete peaks. If we take that part alone and change this to what we call the rho classical, which is an energy distribution of the same electrons uh, that you can get classically from solving the Lorentz equation, Lorentz force equation, you will get a, something that looks like this inverted square root. Um, you can get this classically from the Lorentz force equation looking at an electron accelerated under a field. Um, and changing that will be the only thing we need to actually retrieve the classical theory. Um, and that change, you can actually show that in some parameters is corresponding very well. So that's, a, I think, a really cool example of the classical quantum correspondence. Now, our, now, that only goes so far because when the acceleration becomes very significant, things start breaking up and the electron slips away from the field. And that happens regularly in experiments, in strong experiments with strong enough laser pulses. And that probably also started happening in our experiment um, when that breaks the entire quantum theory I described. And so far, no one knows how to fix it and how to do this properly. We believe that the asymmetry we see in the spectrum, energy spectrum, and we see more and more of that, is the result of the slippage 
Um, and then the analog, the analogy to, quant to quant classical quantum is actually at risk because very awkward things are starting to happen. So that's one of the points where we really want to see what's going to happen in the near future. Um, but still, in the regimes of laser powers that are not too extreme, if we make a comparison, and you can see here the energy distribution without super strong laser power. So you can see that the quantum theory we are describing is doing pretty, pretty well in, in matching to the discrete peaks uh, that we get. And the qu classical theory will only match to the smooth line in an average way. Um, and I think that analogy is a pretty cool way to see the quantum features. And now, of course, the biggest question is to what extent is the quantum theory going to force us to think differently about the design of accelerators of that type and in what regimes this will be important. Um, so uh, I'll probably have to summarize and I'll summarize with a, with a couple of bullets that uh, uh, one is the fundamental theory behind the scenes. We talked about this idea that we can dress the photon by the optical medium. And by thinking about the photon this way, we can really redo quantum electrodynamics with what we call MQED and see different kinds of effects happening there. We saw that the grazing angle condition is something we achieved for the first time in a transmission electron microscope. And doing this was really the uh, experimental uh, technique that allows us to start exploring those effects. And it is on its own a very, a very challenging task. Um, it is interesting to discuss on its own. Um, we also observe this quantized behavior where stimulator radiation and acceleration uh, can occur in really high, super high efficiency for long distances at electron velocities. Um, there are uh, the regimes that we can explore with transmission electron microscopes. And I think what, what is really the meaning of the electron we're seeing there, the energy spread, is that each electron on its own is actually occupying all of those energy levels, all of those energy peaks. That means that each electron on its own is becoming a free electron comb. That electron is actually located at a different point in time at the comb of that type. Yeah. And I think this shows an example where the interaction depends on the electron quantum wave function. And that's the kind of thing we were looking at, looking for from the start. And now we're looking for other places where the radiation, even spontaneous radiation, will depend on the wave function. This is really the original problem I was set to solve, and we didn't re reach it yet. Whether we can get uh, the spontaneous radiation without a driving laser field to also depend on the wave function of the electron. I think that's uh, still a problem that has, has, hasn't been seen experimentally and is extremely interesting from, from my side. Um, and I'll say that we can uh, use this experimental system as a platform for doing a lot of stuff um, that I'm glad to discuss further, but I'll not do it in this talk. We can see it as a platform for exploring cavity QED effects where the free electrons are the atomic systems uh, instead of the atomic uh, elements on their own. Uh, we can use this as a platform for nanoimaging. We have an optical spectroscopy and optical near field microscopy with record capabilities that we can do in the system. And we are exploring those interactions for X-ray sources. We recently measured tunable X-ray radiation from Van der Waals materials. Um, this is coming up in Nature Photonics in about a month. Um, and there is a, a lot of uh, beautiful physics that's coming from that. But I'll uh, stop here and I'm uh, glad to, to take questions. Um, I think there is one or two that I didn't see towards, toward the end. Um, so maybe I'll, and if you want to uh, uh, maybe ask for, uh, let's see. Okay, I see a uh, near surface of the prism. Near the surface of the prism. Uh, wait, I had a bunch of questions that I, uh, the near field also has a transverse component. How does the transverse field influences the final state of the electron? Um, so uh, it, it does has, there is a transverse component to the near field and it could pull, push away the electron or pull it forward. We're lucky enough that if you calculate the typical strength uh, that, of a field that is needed for an interaction that occurs over a few picoseconds, you'll see that we are not in the range where this is a significant change to the electron motion. But this could be an effect at, the, at some point. Um, and it all depends on what size of corrections we're looking at. But lucky for us, this is falling under the paraxial approximation and it's not a critical effect right now, although it will be for a long enough interaction as is seen with a, with a dielectric laser accelerators, for example. Um, 
And there is now a, also a question by, by Dylan. Is the quantum theory of a phase match electron photon interaction amenable to chirping of the phase matching condition? Uh, so as long as it's chirping in the sense of the incoming laser pulse being chirped, then yes, we can catch it. And this is the, uh, we, uh, we discussed this as part of the theory in the paper, in a supplementary. Um, but it's only correct as long as we think about the electron as maintaining a constant velocity, which is uh, only true for some regime of parameters. So for, but we can int introduce the, uh, the laser field as uh, being chirped, yes. Um, now, uh, there is a question, what are the applications of the free electron comb? So what is, what are, what is the community? Why is the community pursuing free electron combs uh, in general? This is actually a problem that has been explored with uh, much simpler comps. Even on the level of just a few photon exchange, you can already make the electron pulse become different because of that interaction. And there, is, there are three uh, groups that actually published papers in 2017 and 18, the Ropers group, the Baum group, and, Hom and Peter Homolov's group, um, all in Germany, uh, published three papers almost back to back about uh, out of second electron pulses. The idea is that you can use laser pulses to change the shape of the electron in time so that electron becomes pulsed. That was uh, a classical description of the electron. Uh, what we are seeing here is a quantum description of the electron. So each electron on its own and not the distribution of many electrons will become pulsed in that way. Um, the one reason to do this is that we see uh, the electron pulse uh, becoming so short in time that we can explore much shorter effects. For example, imagine we want to see the dynamics of charge particles inside a material. We want to see the transport of uh, electrons in a p-n junction and what, it, what those electrons can do. What we really have to do, have is the time resolution on the sub femtosecond time scales, because that's the range of time scales that the electron electron scattering occurs in, a, in matter. So one of the dreams is to have the time resolution to see effects of that type uh, with electron microscopes. And for this, we have to have sub at, like single at a second uh, time scale for the electrons to see the fastest effects uh, in nature. And what we have with this electron comb we had now with a more than a thousand EV energy range is the ability for the first time to go to one or even sub at a second. Um, and I think this is a really exciting direction to, to go with, especially that it's happening on the level of single electron. Um, and there is a, a question from Julia Vampa to, uh, can you elaborate on the possibility of harmonic generation? Somehow the electrons have to create an only narrow oscillating dipole, right? Um, and that, then uh, this, is a, uh, this is a really good point. Um, so how do we know uh, that we expect to see harmonic generation and how do we calculate it? Um, so, Here's, a, uh, here's what uh, people have been thinking about, because this idea is, is, is here in the community before I joined it. Um, when, you saw, uh, when you see hyaluronic generation and how it started, the first experiments that uh, used strong short pulse lasers on metal tips and on atomic systems saw electrons emitted uh, in multiple energy peaks at the same time. Those are relatively low energy electrons, non-relativistic. Non that were accelerated by multi, uh, but by a multi, uh, multiple absorptions of uh, photons. And this is like the photoelectric effect, but with multiple peaks. And then electron, that electron peak looks like what we measured. There are multiple energy peaks, sometimes tens and even hundreds of them. Um, I don't think that anyone in, the, in this community ever saw thousands of peaks like we are seeing now, uh, but still that was causing people to, Im to imagine the scenario where that electron will actually be making transitions that are not one photon, but multiple. And they, indeed, uh, somewhere around the beginning of the 90s, there were, uh, or end, end of 80s, there were a couple of experiments showing how multiple, uh, multiples of the original harmonic was created and you get a comb of many, many harmonics. And that is now a, a big field, high harmonic generation. Um, now we see exactly the same electron energy spectrum created in our setup. So, People expected that to also result in a high harmonic generation. Um, there are, uh, the direct calculation will be to take the average current, take that as a dipole, calculate average dipole. This is exactly how it's done in high harmonic generation and then calculate radiation from that. If you do that with our free electrons, you get uh, 
you get radiation that's supposed to be emitted. No one managed to measure it so far, um, although some groups tried. At least, no, the second harmonic, no, let's not be, or third harmonic, let's not to be, be to uh, uh, ask for too much. No one measure, managed to measure that so far. We think this is because the correct way to calculate it is quite different because of the behavior of the quantum behavior of that electron. Um, we have a, uh, we're working on the quantum theory for harmonic generation that should capture both effects at the same time. You can see this paper on archive um, from our group from uh, end of 2019. It's coming up in NatureCom uh, at some point in a few months. And uh, that's, uh, we show there one reason why there would not always be a harmonic generation created. Um, so that may be why this is not trivial to get it here. I don't know if it's going to be easy or possible to get harmonic generation from free electrons, but I really hope that we find regimes where it happens. Um, so we have a few more questions. Actually, it feels very weird to talk to myself in this way. So if people wrote questions here, maybe they can unmute themselves and uh, ask them. <laughs> I was just gonna say before, before we move on, let's just thank uh, Ido everyone for, for the great talk. So we'll give them a round of applause. Uh, thank you very much. And what I'll do is I'll stop the recording now. And uh, but we those who have questions still can ask Ido um, just verbally by unmuting themselves. So thank yeah, you very much. That will be, that will